Good morning, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> As we return to the book of Judges at the close of this week, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance and praise Him for His loving kindness with all of these examples that we are given that we may understand their import for this time in earth's history. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these many examples that you are providing of how the children of Israel had not served you as they should, how, how they served you but not with their whole heart. How they fell into apostasy again and again so that we may avoid these issues or at least understand them when we see them occurring. Help us now, Father. May your spirit be with us. May your angels attend us. And we ask for your guidance as we open this word Direct us now, direct us each one in this study so that that which we do may bring glory to your name and to your character so that we may more properly give the message that you would have us to give at the close of this earth's history. For this, Father, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we're looking at these things, as we go forward, the crux of the vision, the crux of the example becomes that the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. All the children of Israel that were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. We got into the conversation about the Amorites and the Ammonites, along with this on the Philistines. How one group was attacking from the east, the other was attacking from the west, and the importance of the 18 years. And we just we've just finished going through several points regarding Ezekiel chapter 8. Now, does anybody have any further questions about the importance of the 18 years? Or is there something that you would like to understand at this point? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, good. So sometimes this doesn't work. Oh, my web is down, so I have to phone in. I was wondering if the 18 years was related to that passage in Luke about the 18 that were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell. I'm thinking that the, the 18 with the, to the Tower of Siloam is a different situation with a, a different application. But I'm more than willing to be proved wrong. I really don't know. I just thought I'd throw it in there because I was looking up 18 here and there. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts on that? I don't know. There might be some connection, but I'd have to look into it more. Well, I'm looking at that because we have this tower that's being referenced and the yeah. Tower of Siloam. Mm -hmm. What would we see in reference to a tower? That would be my big question, and we may we may need to revisit this again. Yeah, because Christ was asking whether whether they thought that the people that were slain were worse than the ones that 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 were safe, right? And he said, no, basically they weren't being killed for their sins. I mean, we're all sinners. 
because yeah. the Jews thought that, you know, if, if there was some kind of terrible event that ha- happened to them, then it must be because they're dreadful sinners. Yeah, and this isn't um, a, um, you know, it's not a story that's mentioned in Scripture anywhere. It's something that would have happened recently, you know, in in people's memory. Right. Seems so. But you have, you have this tower of Siloam, but you also have the well. And um, it's, it's referred to as Shiloh, and that's in Isaiah 8. Right, I thought of that too. Yeah. So it could have something to do with, with, with the 25, 20 for the northern tribe? tribe. <clears throat> yeah, possibly. I, you know, I just I don't know enough. But yeah, if we take it as somehow connected to the 2520, um, but I wouldn't put it for the northern tribe. It would be for the southern tribe. Because in Isaiah 8, verse 6, where it's talking about um, the Assyrian invasion, um, here it, it's going to be talking about what happened to northern Israel is going to happen to Judah. Right, okay. Except that it's only going to go up to the neck. So, I mean, maybe it's talking about both 2520s in that sense. Um but in, in this situation with this tower, yeah, is there an interrelationship with John 9 11? Um, well, John 9 11 says, uh, He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, Go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. So here, this would be referring to 9-11, um, right? Right. Okay. And then this is this clay, um, which is then going to allow this person to see or receive their sight. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> so this can relate to both 9-11 and 11-9. That is November 9th, 1989 to 9-11, 2001. And uh, because we have that connection with the 2520 symbolism with 1989. So, so the pool of Siloam then would have that, that connection. But we also have the tower of Siloam. And just, uh, there's 18, um, uh, when the tower fell, 18, uh, were killed, um, but were they, you know, and the question is, were they sinners above all men that were in Jerusalem, which is a rhetorical question, right? That everyone's going to perish unless you repent. So there's, so, I mean, this is like a warning. 9-11 is like a warning of what's going to come upon the world. So here they talk about the well, but we can see that the tower could symbolize um, the destruction at 9-11, right? Because you got the pool, and now you have the tower. So both of them can connect you to um, 9-11. Does that make sense? It can, yeah. And, may, and maybe even one, maybe uh, one refers to November uh November 9, 1989, and the other one to 9-11-2001. But <clears throat> this, this particular story, with its connection with 9-11, mm-hmm. begins in 9-7. Right, right. So he said unto them, go wash in the pool of Siloam, right? So you have that story of the, of the clay here as well, right? Washing his eyes. And then you're going to have uh, the pool of Siloam, um, 
uh, you know, going on here, right? So right. to me, this would refer to um, well, nine eleven or eleven nine, either one, referring to you know, that period from nineteen eighty nine to two thousand one. Right, but I'm I'm looking at these, you know, the separation between these two verses, nine seven to nine eleven. So is that is that could it be considered as a another symbol of four generations? Um, I don't know if it's four generations. I wouldn't do that. Plus, that'd be five verses. But um, well, the nine seven to me goes more to September seventh, uh, uh, two thousand nineteen. And remember how we made this connection between um, what happened in in two thousand nineteen and connecting it to November 9th. I don't know if you remember that. Right, so we had, that's when we were dealing with the 20 months. Right. And as being 20 years. So we went from, uh, how do we do that? Um, 20 months, so. Yeah, so we went from September 11th um, I'm just looking at the chart here. So that connected us to September 23rd, 2017 and to August 29th. Uh, these are the 20 months from because we had 20 lunar months and then we also had 200 months and 220 years and 220 months and 360 months so it's it's a rather complex structure i don't want to go over it again i'm just saying that um that september 7th 2019 was connected to um uh in the sense it's 220 months from september 11th 2001 so 220 30 day months Um, so, so that's what I'm saying is that anyway, this would be this connection between nine, seven and nine, 11. Does that make sense without going into more detail? Yeah, I, it's also a warning against the church aligning itself with the world too, because, uh, that King made a pact, right. And that pact, a, a, a pact with Syria, I think it was. Which you should never have done, of course. Well, he made us some kind of an agreement against his rival. So, mm -hmm. okay. So that so that's just more dealing with that symbol of eighteen. Um, but it it connects us then with what we've already said about the eighteen years. So right. if we remember, we have the 18 years that they can start at 9-11 um, and end in 2019. And so here we, we see the same symbolism with this 18. It ties us to these uh, two events. And, um, and then we also have uh, the 18 years that we had connected to 2012 to 2030. Exactly. So, which we can see that apply here in Judges chapter 10, verse 8. And especially as we go on uh, in Judges. Okay. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan also to fight against Judah, against Benjamin, and also against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was sore distressed. Okay, I have another question actually, before we even go on. Sure. Um, so when we look at the, the children of Israel, they have this Jordan River that divides them, right? Correct. Uh, particularly uh, the two, the, the half tribes of Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh is divided by this Jordan. Um, 
Now, when, when it comes to Gilead, um, so Gilead is, um, I mean, it's the land of Gilead, but it's, it's also a symbol. Um, and, and so how do we understand this division between Gilead, you know, between the east and the west in, in this story? I, I'm not asking the question well. Well, we have the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and then the half tribe of Manasseh that take their portion of the, of the inheritance to the east side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. We have the remnants of Manasseh that take their inheritance to the west side of the Jordan along okay. with Ephraim, along with Benjamin, along with Judah. Right. Now, we know that the crossing of the Jordan is a symbol, right? I mean, it's a symbol of baptism, just as the crossing of the Red Sea was. Right. Uh, but it, we've taken it in these lines as a repeat of history. Right? If we go back to where we were looking at Moses, and then you have Joshua. And Joshua would represent our history. Moses representing, obviously, it, he represents different histories, but primarily, if you put it on the lines from Millerite history to our history, Moses is Millerite history. Joshua's our history on the bigger line, right? Correct. Okay. And then, so then we have this crossing of, of the Jordan. Now, the Jordan, of course, uh, is baptism and baptism represents the cross and Christ being baptized at the beginning of the 70th week um, is prefiguring his crucifixion upon the cross, correct? Right. Right. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the 70th week is that Christ is going to be uh, cut off in the midst of the week, um, which is why the baptism marking uh, the seven, the beginning of the 70th week is so important where Samuel Snow didn't have the baptism marking it. He, he started with the ministry of John. But it's something that we now know that uh, Snow was wrong about. Um, and, and there's reasons why, which I'm not going to go into. But <clears throat> we know that that, um, that also represents 9-11, represents baptism, right? Do we still accept that idea? I believe we we came to that agreement, right? And 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 that means that um, if we're going to um, understand this this the Jordan, so we we have the first angel's message comes up to the Jordan, and then the crossing of the Jordan marks the beginning of the second angel's message. Does that make sense to people? logical okay <clears throat> so so in this movement we have this division that occurs there is um we have on the one side of the jordan on the other side of the jordan now and and this is where i'm i'm trying to i'm struggling a little bit well one is there is this verse um uh, in Jeremiah chapter 8, which I wrote back in 1989 as a scripture song. But um, it goes, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am black. Astonishment, astonishment hath taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Uh, which means, rhetorically, there is a balm in Gilead. There is a physician there. So there's something about that first angel's message. I mean, this could be, um, 
those that are be- that don't aren't benefited by the first angel's message aren't benefited by the second. We can't receive that, which has been addressed many different ways within the movement over the last twenty odd years. Okay, so now within our movement, I mean, we we know we have all these different lines, but we haven't really defined. Um, where that dividing line is. That is, where is the Jordan River at the present time, if that makes sense? Because we know in, in our line, we're zooming into a way mark. Um, so our line itself is a zoom into the Sunday Law way mark on the big line. But within that, that line that we have from 1989 to uh, the Sunday Law, um, we've also zoomed in and we're looking specifically at this movement. And, and that is, it's the second angel's message in this movement. Jeff representing the first angel's message, even though he has a part in proclaiming July 18th, the second angel's message is tied up with July 18th as the prediction before midnight. So it's Samuel Snow's message. So when we deal with this Gilead and in Joshua chapter 10, then, um, or not Joshua, Judges chapter 10, um, then we have, um, it says, you know, about this 18 years, all the children of Israel that were on the other side, Jordan, in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. So, so this group that's on the other side Jordan um, how would we then define this because we have the 18 years and we, we we say there's two different periods of 18 years but this 18 years represents being on the east side of the Jordan does that make sense in the context, I, I know there's a lot of different scattered thoughts. <clears throat> and, and it, then, okay, go on. Is it possible that this is representing the the movement itself returning to the understanding, the, the more primitive Millerite understanding of the first and second angels messages. Which is what I thought. So to me, this was the examining of the foundation. Now, then in verse nine, moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan. So now they're going to come onto the west side of the Jordan to fight against a fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim so that Israel was sore distressed. So this is a transition within the movement itself. And the crossing over the Jordan, wouldn't that be July 18? That's an interesting application for the symbol. Because first, in order to cross over the Jordan. We've been establishing that they had to have gone through the territory of Manasseh or Gad Mm -hmm. to be able to go against Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. Yeah. So you have your three and one where your one is is somewhat hidden. Mm -hmm. But you have the children of Ammon, which would we apply that then to Protestant understanding? Well, yeah, we've taken it as a, um, well, Protestant understanding within uh, Adventism. Okay. Right. Could it be in this movement too, though? Because ever since July 18th, there have been they, there have been some people that say, "Well, the chron- chronology is wrong, so let's throw out 
everything to do with chronology. And it's too hard for us to apply ourselves to understand anyway. Yeah. So the crossing over of the children of Ammon is this understanding of Adventism coming back into the movement, which is what we saw happen after July 18th. Okay. I think the symbolism is, is giving us some very salient points. Mm -hmm. Because then we're going to see the message of Jephthah, because this is, is going to be fighting, that's the next chapter, but fighting against this message of the Ammonites. And Jephthah is a message that has been exiled. It's seen as illegitimate. And, and so we'll see that this all fits together really nicely with what's happening. Okay. Now, as we continue with this, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. So we are being given an example. We have forsaken our God. In forsaking God, would we make the application here that this is the rejection of Miller's rules? Mm -hmm. And serving Balaam is that not serving or accepting the thoughts of men rather than the thoughts of God? Mm -hmm. How should we, how else should we apply this? Yeah, it's the Protestant understanding. Okay. Now, the way that this was, this was approached by the translators, we would go to 1 Samuel 12, 10. And they cried unto the Lord and said, we have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served, have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. So we're dealing with an issue later where it's not just forsaking God and serving Balaam. It's also forsaking God, serving Balaam and Ashtaroth. Yeah, the Lord and the Lady. Right. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? Now, I ask if this was initially, if this was not for enemies, and what you had pointed out was that this was actually an enemy living in the area of what had been another. So you would have a threefold enemy here. Um, okay. So, so this is referring to the past. I think I was talking earlier about the land of the Amorites. So they were uh, delivered from the Egyptians. So that's the Exodus. Right. And then they were delivered from the Ammonites. That's going to be, or Amorites, pardon me. That's going to be numbers 21. Right. And, and then from the children of Ammon, that's Judges chapter 3. And then from the Philistines, that's, okay. and that we had studied in Judges chapter 3 as well, the second part of Judges chapter 3. So, so that's what's being referred to here. So these are the enemies of the past that they've been delivered from. But then it also says the Zidonians also the Amalekites and the, and it says Minoites, I'm not sure if that refers to the Midianites, did oppress you and you cried to me and I delivered you out of their hand. So altogether there are seven that are listed. Correct. And 
Now, interesting um, um, footnote, maybe, I don't know, but um, Loughborough, when it came to Leviticus 26, Loughborough had a unique uh, interpretation of Leviticus 26. And, and I think this was written in, um, I think it was in this like a, either a Sabbath school lesson or it was maybe some youth quarterly or something like that. Some kind of book. I can't remember the book. Uh, but anyway, Loughborough refers to Leviticus 26. And when he deals with the four seven times, he he deals with it as symbols of seven seven different enemies at four different times if i remember correctly if that's how he did it okay um, so the seven times he sees as seven seven deliverances so he tries to fit this into some kind of of structure that basically there's 28 times they were delivered from their enemies um which of course I don't think is a correct view, at least definitely not a, uh, the primary understanding of Leviticus 26. But the point here is you can see that these 70 enemies, seven enemies can represent the seven times. And so this could be a reference to the seven times as, um, you know, dealing with our time, if that makes sense. But also we could we could look at this as symbolic of um, you know the Egyptians aren't an enemy that was left in the land, but these other ones were that they're going to have as false messages, and so they could also represent messages in the movement. Okay, so if these are representative of messages in the movement, we're, we're going to have to identify some of the messages. Well, when we already did, right, with, the, with, the, with some of them, because we already went through that in Judges. Right. The Egyptians, though, would not be um, one of those. It's not dealing with the Judges, because they're delivered from the Egyptians with the Exodus itself. And so the deliverance from the Egyptians um, would be would mark what part in our history? Maybe um, because we also have 9/11 representing uh, baptism or the Red Sea crossing, right? Well, the deliverance from the Egyptians was so that the children of Israel would understand the covenant that God wanted to establish with them, right? Yeah. Now, that covenant and that deliverance from the Egyptians, would we not place that with the understanding of Leviticus 25 and 26 so that we would more clearly understand the covenant that God was offering to the movement. Okay, so we, we when we studied uh, the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, right? right. We saw that this was connected to um, uh, Genesis chapter fifteen. This is the covenant made with Abraham, where he's going to cut the animals in half, and it's going to represent this chiasm. And halfway in that chiasm, they're going to enter into Egypt. So 215 years uh, is their sojourning in the land of Canaan. And then Jacob enters into the land of Egypt um, when Joseph is 39 years old. And, um, and uh, Jacob is 90, is, uh, let me see here, so 39, 91, so that, how old was he? Um, so that would have been 140 years old, right? No. 130. 130. 130. Yeah, 130. Okay. So he's 130 years old. When he talks to Pharaoh, he tells him how old he is. And we know that he's going to live um, another 17 years, right? Correct. 
you know, five, five left of the famine and then 12 years after the, the famine. Okay, so, so we have Egypt there represented at the beginning, but it's, the, it's at the end of that period of 430 years that they're going to be delivered from the Egyptians. And then we know that there is uh, uh, the time they wander in the wilderness, and then they're going to be uh, delivered from the Amorites uh, after, after they cross the Jordan, or in connection with crossing the Jordan, let's put it that way, and the children of Ammon and from the Philistines. So we looked at these different deliverances, but it's going to start with Egypt. And so your point is specifically that this represents what in our history well i was taking it with the egyptians when they were delivered from the egyptians they were delivered to an understanding of the covenant because by the time they had been in egypt they had no clue what the law of god or the covenant of god meant for them or to them so the covenant would be 9-11 so when we're coming to this, I, the covenant is an awakening of the need, or excuse me, 9-11 is awakening of the need to come to an understanding. But by 2005, within this movement, Elder Jeff was coming to an understanding of the need of Leviticus 25 and 26 mm-hmm. for our understanding at this time. Okay. So I I would look at this that the awakening began at 9/11 and the reason for the awakening became clear in 2005 because we began to understand what the seven times were really meaning for us. Okay, so then you're saying that this starts at 9-11 and continues it, okay. to the seven. It, yeah, it, it has to continue because once that, once that is in place, when the children of Israel began to cry unto the Lord in their, in their slavery, not all of them were understanding what the law of God was. And we see that repeated several times within the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. And we already established, you know, from chapter two, that the book of the judges deals with the history from 9-11, at least to 2023, but probably including up to 2030. Very possibly, yes. Even if it's just a symbol, even if 2030 is just a symbol. And so this is about the covenant that is the history of the judges, even though it's this history of all this apostasy, it's about the history of God wanting to enter into covenant with his people. Right. Okay. And and we'll see as we go through these stories, and then we get the story of Samson, how this all fits together. So there's, there's a lot ahead of us that, is just going to repeat what we've already learned, but make it, I think, sort of tie it up um, so that we can see it. You know, all those loose threads are going to be, um, you know, brought together. So stepping back for just a second, Judges 10.10, is representationally the second angel's message. Okay. The children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. We have not feared you, neither have we given you glory. And they continue into this with 1011 because they have to come on into the understanding of what it means to truly worship God. And we're being shown that these seven enemies that are being referenced from 1011 and 1012 
have been these other messages that have come into the movement and that need to be rejected within the movement. Mm -hmm. So the opposition to the 2520 is the same as the Egyptians. Then we have the Amorites, the children of Ammon, and then the Philistines, the Zidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maoites. Now let's, let's, let's not forget the situation with the Amalekites. Why was this such a, a huge situation with the children of Israel? that the Amalekites did that brought upon them the curse and ire of God. Well, it was attacking them from behind the weak. It, it was attacking the aged, the infirm, and the children. Yeah. So the, the, those of the children of Amalek were looked on with great disfavor. I mean, the situation with the Egyptians, this was a frontal attack. This is one that, that came at them directly, and they didn't really understand that much of how to defend, but they learned how to defend it. Yeah. The Amalekites were a warlike people that were also cowardly. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's go back here. So you've got the Egyptians. That's going to be the, the opposition against the 2520. Right. Uh, the Amorites, that's going to be, because um, we, had, we had addressed that, in um now that's that's in numbers right 21 and that's sihon king of the amorites what was the meaning of sihon um tempestuous okay And, and this is going to be, um, so that's going to be later, they talk about Sihon, the king of the Abarites, Judges 11. Um, so I'm a little confused on how, how this all fits together. Well, but anyway. Would uh, Sihon that? have been a title? Yeah, I think so, because this is going to refer to something earlier, initially, because um, that's going to be Numbers 21, and, and we had looked at this. Now I'm forgetting some of this. With his name or his title being tempestuous, could that also refer to Acts 28? about your Clyden east wind, the tempestuous east wind. Okay. So if the Egyptians were, are being equated with the 2520, is it possible that the Ammonites or Amorites could be equated with the message of Islam? Okay, so the story of how about um, the issue regarding Joel? I'm asking then if the if Ammon or the Philistines is more Joel. 
Okay, so, okay, so the Amorites, so, so just dealing with 9-11 and Islam. Right. Okay. Because we first have to have an understanding of the covenant. Yeah. And then once we're understanding the covenant, we start to understand these elements that are also necessary for our further continued education and that's where islam comes in right so so after 9 11 in 2005 uh we we come to understand the 25 20 but jeff had not initially attached um august 11th 1840 to 9 11 right right? that took him time so that was going to be the next issue that created division in the movement and um because these all did each of these things did create division in the movement that is jeff had many people who were following him as he started to understand things further uh they just ended off not following him anymore it wasn't like the division in 2014 where you actually have ministries leaving the movement but you did have individuals not being able to walk in the advancing light. Correct? Exactly. Okay. So then we have the children of Ammon, and you're going to say that that is going to be addressing um, uh, the understanding of uh, Joel, the book of Joel, so 2014. I think that's that, that's possible, yeah. And that and that's kind of how we looked at it already. When when we went back, um, uh, when we when we went through judges earlier, and then the Philistines. So you're going to have the east, and then you have the west, and from the Philistines. Um, now, Parminder is going to specifically uh, be related to. Um, the history of Judges chapter 5, right, with Sisera. Correct. Okay. And that's going to be um, uh, with Sisera, that is going to be um, So we got the Zidonians are going to be chapter five, Sisera, and then the Amalekites are going to be chapter six, and that's going to be um, when the Midianites and the Amalekites come up against Israel. And that's going to be Gideon, right, which we say is going to relate to the message of July 18th. So this is fitting in with what we already saw. Um, So now you've got uh, the Zidonians, the Amalekites, and then the Moanites. And that, and, and some people have that's the Midianites. That is, the Amalekites and the Midianites is referring to the story of Gideon. Um. So there are are difference of opinion on how to look at the Minoites. And that's, so so it doesn't seem that 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 would fit in if it's the Minoites, but I don't know if anybody has any understanding of that. It would fit in with the Midianites. It would fit better with the Midianites. Yeah. What do we know about the Manoites? Um, the only reference we really have is um, in uh, uh, Joshua fifteen fifty five. I mean, they're mentioned, and then later on you have them mentioned in. 
First Samuel about, I mean, the wilderness of Mo, Moa, Ma, Maon, however you say that, Maon. Um, um, so they're, they're, but they don't seem to be referenced in any of this preceding history. Other than, you know, Joshua 5.15 mentions the place, but we have no record of them being delivered from the Minoites. But we do have from the Midianites. What is the name meaning of the Manoites? Um, okay. I have it as a, a place of habitation. So if it's a place of habitation, Could this Manoite be the, the issue that we are currently taking from the church itself? Would this, rep would this represent the opposition that we've been seeing from the church itself? I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I just think that this is just another reference to the Midianites um, in some way. Um, I mean, lots of uh, translations translated as Midianites. So we, we would place the Amalekites and the Manoites as, as being equivalent? No. Okay. Uh, the Amalekites, because when, with Gideon, you're going to have... Um, the Midianites and the Amalekites being the enemy. Um, so when, when you look at this um, and you read this, uh, it's, it's definitely they're, they're listing seven names, but they're not listing seven events. Um, so, so they talk about the Egyptians, they're delivered from the Amorites. They're delivered from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines. The Zidonians also, which is just, I, I don't know whether I put it as an added word because um, I don't see the word also there. And the Amalekites and the Midianites did oppress you. So the Amalekites and the Midianites did oppress you uh, to me is grouping those two together. Okay. Now, um, I'm just going to read this in Hebrew. Just hang on. Okay, so Sidonians. Okay. Yeah, that's um yeah, so I, I would just put the Amalekites and the Midianites together. Okay. Um, but but the Sidonians, that's gonna be and, and these are kind of related. So I mean this is a four three combination. Right? I wouldn't disagree. So just like in Revelation, and there's so many examples of this where you have, uh, you know, the four, um, the four uh, churches and then the three, you have the four seals and the three, you know, so those types of things. So seven being divided into four and three. Right. Um, and so, so when we deal with, um, these last three, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Midianites, uh, this would be referring to that history dealing with Parminder 
and which is in a sense we're still in that time even with the Amalekites and the Midianites even with the story of July 18th because remember when the the declaration of December 6 2020 was really just a reiteration of Parminder's opposition to July 18th I can see that Right, because they use the same arguments that Parminder used. Um, and they use the same type of authority that Parminder was using. So um, so anyway, that, that's the way I would look at this. So this is a seven, uh, which is a complete, a perfect uh, number of these things that God has delivered us from. It's grouped into four and three, and the last three specifically uh, relate to July 18th. All right. But then, you know, we have this, they worshiped other gods. So that, oh. that then is addressed. So he's already delivered them, but they're still worshiping and serving other gods. Now, with this, with what's being said here in 1013, yeah. yet ye have forsaken me. Even though I've delivered you, you have forsaken me and have served other gods, have chosen other messages. Uh Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. And this is a message to this movement. Correct. So. When we're looking at this portion, we see that the translators would have given reference to Deuteronomy 32.15, and Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Is Jeshurun representing the movement in its current condition? Okay. Well, with with Jeshurun, I mean, even of itself, that's kind of an obscure reference. Um, so it refers to what? What is Jeff, Jeshurun uh, a reference to? Because... It means upright one. Okay. Symbolic name for Israel describing her ideal character. Um, That's what Brown's Drivers Briggs says. Okay. Right. So you talk about Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, Isaiah 44, verse verse 2. So this is just another name for Israel, but in his ideal state. Well, when they, when they also compared this with Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no more. Now, if, if you are a broken cistern, if you are holding no water, how are you going to give a message? How are you going to present the living water before the people? Jeshurun waxed fat, self-sufficient. Before July 18th, this message that was going out, there were those that were very happy that this message was going out because they saw this as a um vindication of the of this message itself and then when it didn't happen it led to a lot of questions it led to a lot of issues so would the would the issue post July 18th, that occurred by December 6th, 
be the same as forsaking God, that the upright one has forsaken God and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now they're referencing, why are they bringing us to this verse? What, what is their reason for? Because that's dealing with, you've forsaken me and served other gods. So, right. so this is them forsaking God. And, and God's people have, the upper right ones, um, the movement has. Right. So we're given these, these examples from Deuteronomy, from basically the, the word of God to Moses, and then we're given this with Jeremiah. So we have these three examples of forsaking God. Now, we know this is going to lead to a repentance. Agreed. But first, God says, go and cry unto the gods you have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. So it's a, a situation being very, very specific. I've abandoned you. You wanted to worship other gods. You wanted to accept other methods of study. You did not want Miller, the, the Miller's rules. You didn't want the warnings of Mrs. White. You wanted to say that she is less than the Bible. So I can't be more blunt with you than that. So go worship the other gods. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Let them be your source of strength after December 6th. Yeah. And now, I mean, I would include in here the conspiracy theories, uh, Trump going to be president again, all these types of things, which ignore the lessons that we were being taught with July 18th. Agreed. And... Um, you know, as we're going to see, there's a repentance that goes on, which is what we have been arguing for for a long time, is that this movement has to be healed and restored in order to accomplish the task that God had given it. And, and the way that that comes about is through this repentance, this self-examination. And... Um, You know, through personal study, it's something that happens on an individual level first, but it is going to bring us to an upper room experience. But there's still some disturbing things as we move ahead in oh, yeah. 10, 11, and 12. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, we have sinned, do thou unto us whatsoever is good in thine eyes or seemeth good unto thee deliver us only we pray thee this day they're asking to be delivered they're asking to be to receive the blessing that they have turned their backs upon yeah so they're they're going to recognize they've rejected a message. So then, as we would go, and they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the misery of, of Israel. So they put away the gods of strangers, and his soul was shortened for the misery of Israel. So 
when you're putting away the gods of strangers, are you not abandoning the messages that you had chosen to accept? Mm -hmm. Are you not abandoning the methods of study that the rest of the so-called Christian world have been using? How else are we going to put away the gods of strangers? Because obviously this, these are people or a, a message that became well-known to the children of Israel and became well-known within the movement. But these are strangers to God. Yeah. I mean, when we, when we were touching on different points from Revelation, when we are touching on, on different points from the gospel writers, does Christ not, did, are there not people that come to Christ saying, but we have done this in your name, we have done this in your name, and what does he then say to them? Department. Apart from, I never knew you. And is that not symbolically, if Christ doesn't know you, is that not the same thing as saying you are a stranger to me? Right. So what else do we see here about this? How else can we apply this to the different messages and within the movement? How can we apply this to ourselves? So one is we know that we have to repent. Right. Okay. So we know that we've, we've not had, we rejected the message that God has given us. And we have to put these away. And so they're going to do this. So there's going to be this healing that happens in the movement. Now we'll see, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I'm always going ahead here, but you no know, judges 10, 17, we have that paragraph marking thing. Right. Right at the beginning there. So this is a new section. Correct. Put the chapter division there. They're going to put the div chapter division two verses later, which hides uh, the fact that the story of Jephthah is connected with verses 17 and 18 of chapter 10. Right. So chapter 11 is going to be about Jephthah. And they're first going to give background information regarding him. But this is the deliverance of Jephthah is going to be connected with this verse 17. Okay. He's, going to, he's going to deliver them from Ammon. The children of Ammon. So he's going, he's going to make this, this delivery from one of the three enemies. Yeah, and it's, and it's going to happen here after this repentance. So this is something still future. But it's going to give us this background history of what the message of Jephthah represents, how it was treated, and, and why and how that message is restored. So, so that's why it's important here to recognize there's this division in, in Judges 10 and 17, that it's actually connected with chapter 11. Okay. They're all connected, but Judges 10 has given you the background of their, um, those 18 years in which they're being oppressed. But Judges 10, 17 now is going to introduce 
the deliverance from that. Well, okay, help me understand this. Because as, as this section is written, uh -huh. then the children of Ammon were gathered together. Okay, now that, in English, that means one thing. But in the alternate Hebrew, then the children of Ammon were cried together. Yeah, or cried together. Yeah, the children of Ammon cried together. And encamped in Gilead. So now we know that the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. Right, Why, which is the watchtower. The watchtower. Why is it necessary for us to look at this in the Hebrew that the children of Ammon cried together? Okay. Um. Well, cried together here is, um, and so why they translate it that way it means to shriek. Um, so why they translate it is gathered, I'm not sure. Um, by, well, it says by implication to proclaim an assembly. But it's interesting that it's this word shriek. But in this situation, is are the children of Ammon then worshiping their God? Well, it, you know, it says, well, well, it's like to cry out for help, right? Okay, um, so they're they're gathering together in the in this land of Gilead, right? Which is um, on the east side, Jordan, right? And then the children of Israel they're going to be encamped in Mizpah, and Mizpah is located where there are there's one well there's other places but it's also in gilead right okay now there's two places called gilead one's gilead one's north of the jabbok jabbok and one's south of it and and the one is the location the north one is location of laban's cairn and um and the one south of the jabbok jabbok they're they're not sure where it's located but that's what's referred to there's also a place near mount hermon which this wouldn't be and an old sacred place in benjamin which this wouldn't be so it would be probably the one that's on the south of gilead or the south of jaybuck i mean in gilead okay now i'm i'm looking at at some maps purported to be of the of the area of the children of israel so trying to get yeah. to come to an understanding of this because we're looking at this as being to the east of the jordan yeah it's east of the jordan so it's in gilead okay Would this have been north of Sukkoth? Um, I don't know. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm not sure where it's located. Only that it's in in Gilead. Okay, now is this is this Gilead the same as Ramoth Gilead? Or is this different? This is different. Okay. Yeah. So so Gilead is the the part east of the Jordan, right? Um, and then you have, I mean, I'm just looking at different maps here. Yeah. Often they're going to show, I'm looking up Mitzpah in Gilead, and I'm not sure why they give me all these places in, on the other side of the Jordan, on this side of the Jordan. Uh, maybe it is Ramoth Gilead. That's possible, but I just find it interesting. Ramoth Gilead's a city in Gilead. That's all. So this is we're looking for for um, Mitzpah and and they're just it says just says they are camped in Gilead. So that's a I, I don't think it's in Ramoth Gilead, but I don't know. I just I, I'm looking at all of this, trying to trying to come to an understanding of of how they're approaching this. But the children of Ammon cried together, shrieked together, and encamped in Gilead. And the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. So, so I think this Mizpah would probably be north of the River Jabbok. Um, and the Ammonites are coming into the southern part of Gilead. So that's where they're going to have this. Uh, that's where they're having this standoff, I guess. All right. So it's going to be, you know, you know, somewhere halfway between the, the Dead Sea and, and the Sea of Galilee, a little bit south of, the, of Midway and not far from the Jordan River. So we're talking about this either being within the territory of Manasseh or we're talking it being within the territory of Gad. Yeah, actually, well, it looks to me like it's more in the territory of Gad. Okay. As if we're dealing with, uh, well, it's right around there anyway. It's it's along that border. So whether where exactly it is, I don't know. Okay. Now, in this situation, when we come to this with Mitzvah, the translators gave reference to one verse out of Genesis and a couple of verses earlier or later, actually, in Judges. So, Genesis 31, 49, and Mitzvah, for he said, the Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent one from another. So this is the, div the division of Jacob and his household from Laban and his household, right? Yeah. But then we come to this and they're using the, the portion that's going to come that we're going to get into on Sunday. Judges 11.11, 11, which again is a doubling. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captive over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. 
and then 1129, surprisingly, 18 verses later. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mitzpah of Gilead, and from Mitzpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. So Mitzpah is going to have quite a bit in what we're going to be studying to do with, with what we're going to have to look at. And is Mitzpah going to be a message for the movement to give? Okay. Um, okay, just before I ask, answer your question, and you can state it again, but... So this is the place of Gilead, north of the Jabbok, where Laban's a heap of witnesses. Okay. And it's called Mitzvah, Mitzvah because of this heap of witness. Because it's, it's symbolically a watchtower. Right? Because right. it's a watch between uh, Laban and, um, and uh, Jacob. Correct. And they're absent from one another. Um, and then it says, if thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take wives, other wives besides my daughters, no man is with, with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. Um, so they're going to have the, then Laban said to Jacob, behold this heap and behold this pillar, which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness and this pillar witness that I will not pass over this heap to thee and thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. Right. So it's, it's sort of like a peace pact uh, between right. them. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's what's being addressed here in this mid spot where they're gathered. So between Jacob and Laban, there was a, a pact of peace. Mm -hmm. Between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon, we do not have a pact of peace at this point. No. So with one group, Laban, we are going to work peaceably with the Ammonites. We are not going to work peaceably. We, we are in opposition to them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon. He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Right, so Gilead has these Ammonites in it. Um, the children of Israel are gathered and encamped in Mitzpah. And they say, whatever man is going to, uh, well, it says, begin to fight, that is, um, take up this battle um, against the children of Ammon, and that if he does, he will be the head, or that is, uh, the leader over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Right. Why is it that the children of Israel, they recognize that they're forsaking God, and they immediately want a, a physical human leader? Why do we also have this same issue within the movement? Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to understand here with, with Judges chapter 11. Because uh, they're going to ask Jephthah, the Gileadite, um, who is a mighty man of valor, they're going to ask him, um, and he's the son of a harlot, uh, they're going to ask him to deliver them. And he's going to be a deliverer of Israel. Right. Um, so 
but he's they're going to go through the story of how he was basically exiled and they're going to he's going to be the one that they're going to call so i mean they don't have anybody who can lead their army except this person they they exiled i would say that that that's the uh, the way it looks yeah the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner type of idea. Yeah. And of course, we know in our application of this, we're not looking at people, we're looking at messages. All right. So we're not going to have some person in this movement who's going to lead the movement. But there is a message that had been exiled that's going to be called upon. So July 18th. It's possible. I mean, we haven't looked at chapter 11 and 12 yet. There's lots there. I just think that this is going to be interesting to look at this as to how this interrelates with the movement currently. Well, yeah, I mean, because I read ahead and, and I saw that I can see the parallel. So, um, and that's what we're going to look at, I guess, next week is we're going to look at the story of Jephthah. But in the story of Jephthah, we also have the tragic vow. Yeah. And... And then chapter 12, we have Jephthah's, Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim. And so we're going to have to figure what all this is about. Um, and then there's still going to be other judges that follow. So, I mean, we're putting this story of Jephthah, I, I mean, basically at the present time. That is, it's, we're on the border of that that message because it's the end of the 18 years. Um, of course, you know, we're saying the 18 years uh, ended in 2019, but it also ends in 2030. So, but it's all connected because everything happening right now is connected to both of those histories. Yeah, well, you know, I hope for people, you know, watching these studies that, you know, this doesn't seem too esoteric. I mean, to me, it seems very, very clear what we've been looking at in the book of Judges. Any thoughts by anybody? Because we're at the end of our time. I think there's going to be quite a bit for us to address when we when we return to this on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And could everybody pray that my net is restored? I did call ExploreNet, and they're as puzzled as I am. So they said the last resort would be sending somebody here to fix it, try to fix it. Yeah, sometimes uh, your satellite dish gets knocked by wind and stuff. but it hasn't been a wind, though, not lately. Yeah. Anyway, so... Any final thoughts, though, on this, what we're studying? This you know, I, I see your point that these last two verses should have been combined with the following chapter. Yeah, because it, it, it makes no sense if you don't. Uh, because then you would draw to the conclusion, well, where is this story of Jetha coming from? But, but it definitely follows uh, verse 17 and 18. It's just that it's reiterating the background for Jephthah, right? So he's somebody that existed, um, that had been uh, exiled, so to speak, and and now he's going to be called upon. So that's it's a very interesting chapter. Yep, it is. Okay. So as we have as we have come to the end of our time today, should
Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these many lessons that we are seeing and that we are applying to the time in which we live today. We ask, Father, for your guidance and your direction. There are those that are in need of assistance so that they may join with these meetings. We ask, Father, for your direction and your blessing in their regard. Help us now as we go forward. Direct us as we continue to study. Help us to prepare and to be guided so that the message that you would have this movement to give may be given with clarity to this world at the end of this history. Help us to this end. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.